What was your experience with the darkness retreat? You spend an extended period of time just sitting alone in a dark room, just with yourself, just allowing the kind of like frenzy of your subconscious to slowly start to surface. You sit through that long enough and you have visualization. Memories will come up. I'm typically hoping and waiting for some type of like transcendent OMG moment. That actually is the thing. Aaron Alexander. And he's a movement coach and therapist who's helped the world's best athletes. He is the host of the Align podcast and author and creator of the Align method. How would you define masculinity? Being courageous enough to tell the truth. To like being honest within yourself, honest within all aspects of your life. What are some of the ways that you can advise people to embrace doing uncomfortable things? Do thing that comes to mind is like so first question that i had through yeah. researching this which i was actually genuinely interested in because this is something i've looked into mm. is your experience with the darkness retreat oh cool tell me about that because i've done the vipassana the 10-day solid meditation retreat yeah me too you've done it as well did you do that first uh -huh. and then the darkness retreat after yeah yeah not like in any you know intentional sequencing but yeah okay okay yeah. so it'll be in the same sequence yeah. curious to know then yeah um what was your experience and what were the lessons that you learned from that experience um well what is it exactly actually for people that don't know what dark, darkness retreat it's something that's happened for you know at least hundreds of years that it's, it's popular in uh germany is i think one of the, the main places it became like popular mm -hmm. in the west um, it happened in, I believe it was the Amazon is the original place that it started happening. I believe Columbia, if I remember correctly, I had Scott, the founder of it's called sky cave retreats. I was actually just texting with him before on the way over here, uh, about having my girlfriend do a darkness retreat. Ooh, potentially she's interested in doing it. Um, and the, uh, it's, you spend, you know, extended period of time just sitting alone in a dark room just with yourself. So there's no place to have distractions of any sort other than just allowing the kind of like frenzy of your subconscious to slowly start to surface. It's a lot like a Vipassana in that way. So if you sit in Vipassana, you know, Gwenka is a guy that, that founded the, the modern Vipassanas that people mm -hmm. go to, uh, his suggestion and other people in the meditation space would be that pretty much most of the things that ail you, whether it's some type of neurotic behavior or some type of anything that's kind of like destructive it's like challenging to hold in your life if you just sit with yourself long enough without avoiding you know and all the different various different iterations that we have of avoidant behavior mm -hmm. now we just have like such a massive abundance of avoidance we don't really ever need to be with ourselves until something catches on fire and like all the right. wheels are falling off and like oh my god i need to change that usually is what forces a person into being with the subconscious uh, Carl Jung has the bit of, of, uh, until you make the, the unconscious conscious, you will forever control your life and you'll call it fate paraphrasing. Mm. Uh, you know, and so something like a Vipassana is a really active exploration of that, of just sitting and observing, ah, my back hurts. Ah, I think I don't like the voice of this person. Oh, this person's seems like they're like snoring beside me. Are oh, they mm. breathing too loud? I'm so hungry. This was such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be here. This is for other people. This is, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. Like all those different uh, That's adaptive right. patterns that we have to get <laughs> us the heck out of. Yes. You know? And then if you sit through that long enough, then this other aspect will come up and maybe you'll have visualizations and maybe you'll have um, memories will come up or, you know, it's. I think that's something that's really important of a person that's interested in exploring the journey of meditation or mindfulness or any of that stuff would be we're typically, or I'm typically hoping and waiting for some type of like samadhi, psychedelic, transcendent OMG moment. Mm -hmm. And the feelings of just being like, oh, my thoughts are pacing and I can't stop freaking thinking. Like that actually is the thing. Like you're right, in it. Right. You're right in, in the oh, right. exactly where you ought to be. Um, you know, and, and if you do that long enough, suddenly you kind of get through that layer of things and you'll typically notice some sensation of ease manifest you're like oh wow cool like oof. yeah that anxiety or fear or whatever the thing was like that I've, I've been holding down somewhere in my gut or my heart or my throat or you know somewhere in my body it started to come up i, I was feeling it it's probably telling me to get the heck out of this sensation mm. i chose not to i kept feeling it i accepted it and now on the other side of that is a greater amount of ease and liberation
So the darkness retreat is kind of like that. In some ways, Vipassana is, is uh, easier. In some ways, it's harder. But the darkness retreat, you can do whatever you want. Right. So you wander around, pace around. There's like a, a bathtub in there. So I do cold plunges. It's in the Oregon. Yeah. It's in the mountains in, in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And or like the hills more in Oregon. And so the water, I did it in the wintertime. And yeah. so it's like ice cold water. And you could do hot as well. But I chose ice cold because I was wow. just looking for sensation. Yeah. And so I would go through these bouts of essentially like making myself, I wouldn't recommend the same way, but making myself be borderline hypothermic. And then uh, I would then have the task of heating myself up. So I'd get out of the bath and like butt naked. It's completely pitch black. You can't see anything. Yep. And I'm doing like push-ups and jumping jacks and all sorts of you know weird nonsense. Oh, Pretty much more avoided behavior, I would say. <laughs> it's me like being like, okay, I'm going to choose a task right. instead of actually being able to just be still and sit with myself. Right. So you're distracting yourself at the end of the day. Still kind of distracting myself. Mm. So I kind of had the the thought while I was in the, so I did five nights and four days in the, in the thing. So I went on like a Thursday night, you walk in, you know, you have some time, you have a little like candle. That's like your last, your last light. Yeah. And then, you know, when you choose to, you blow out the candle and then it's like, it's kind of like an interesting ominous moment when you, when you blow out the candle. Um, and then you just freaking sit with yourself. You usually sleep for a really long time the first night. Most people report mm-hmm. that. And then <clears throat> sleep becomes a little bit more random after that. You start having visualizations. Um, I did. I think it's, it's quite common people start having visualizations after like two or three days yeah or so which they're more <clears throat> just actually like noise like the visualizations there was nothing really overly profound about it and start like see my body would start trying to see where the room was mm. you know so be like oh yeah i see the door and Did I you really that. not see anything at this point because you're zero eyes get used to no no, no dark but this is just done in a way it's completely i mean your eyes get used to the dark but there needs to be some light for your pupils to be able to dilate to right. be able to like capture right yeah you know? so there's literally zero light wow um and it's just, it's kind of like you already had the experience of Vipassana. It's like Vipassana, but, you know, in a dark room with yourself mm-hmm. instead of meditating in a room of 50 people. But that must be different, right? Like, I, the closest thing that I have is I would go to a dark restaurant or even the dark restaurant. And what's cool about the experience is it's like where blind people can work. So they'll guide you to your table and you can't see anything. Mm. But then you're opening up senses that you're not used to opening up when you're eating. So you're often eating with your hands and... Because you're not seeing, you have these sixth sense things that you're, you're able to taste more, you're able to feel more. Yeah. Whispers are coming in that you thought were really close, but they're probably like three feet away. It's like they're way further than you think. Yeah. So with this darkness retreat, because you can't see, were there senses and experiences or thoughts or visions that you were having that the pasana didn't provide? Because with a pasana, you're able to see and... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you become, and your brain will naturally do that. Like if you if you lose a sense, your brain will start to myelinate other parts of the brain to kind of like refill that, like the real estate that you lost with mm. whatever the sense that is that you lost, will start to get refilled by by neighbor yeah. senses. So you'll yeah. actually get, get stronger in mm. other senses. So your hearing gets stronger, or your you know taste or touch or any of that, which is pretty freaking cool. Right. Right. Um, and yeah, there's definitely a sensation of like more higher acute sensation of of uh, touch and sound they bring food once a day and so you have some level of like anchor of like okay they bring food around like five or six or whatever yeah so it's it's kind of like that it's like a dark restaurant for right for five days or whatever yeah yeah yeah. um but yeah there was a, there was a little bit of increase like but nothing that i noticed that was like oh my god i have like superhuman every other sense yeah, anymore. yeah but a little bit a little bit higher acuity with that afterwards coming out i think the sense that was probably the most pronounced was probably just like a sense of feeling mm-hmm. so after doing the darkness retreat i came out and was i just like cried a lot mm-hmm. <clears throat> after or during or both mostly after mostly after okay. a lot of crying during um, but yeah, after, afterwards there was like a, it was almost like this, like, well had been deepened and allowed me to access feelings of both sadness and joy that I wasn't really able to access as much before, mm. which I think is just an ongoing process of maturity, you yeah. know, like a, particularly being a young boy, you know, eventually man, uh, growing up in a culture that prizes stoicism, yeah, you know, and like hardness, stay hard. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a, a term, male normative lexithmia, that essentially translates to 
you know, male dudes, normative, normal, alexithmia, a lack of capacity to be able to express mm. your emotions into into words. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, I have all this feeling inside of me. Yes. I'm not going to get out. So I'm just going to punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> when really what i'm saying is like i'm i'm afraid yeah you know or i'm in this insecure yeah. or i'm you know I have all these different feelings i'm just i'm not able to actually get it out of here mm. and so i just build up tension and build up all these compensatory patterns and then i start getting jacked and then maybe i do start on steroids maybe i get a corvette yeah you know, and i'm like cool like i'm totally strong I'm totally stable i'm totally safe mm. you know meanwhile internally there's probably a lot of doors that you just haven't um you know been had the the resources to be able to, to open yeah often and was that the intention for you to go into the darkness retreat was to work on being able to feel more because that's that was something you were struggling really i do a lot i do a lot of that stuff for ego purposes i do a lot of that stuff for like the adventure mm -hmm. um and so then know that you can do it kind of mm, yeah yeah yeah, I think the I think more for me the reason going into it, and naturally when you elect to do things like that, your perspective of why you're doing it just organically changes as a product of doing it. It's like if you go to an ayahuasca ceremony because you want to talk about ayahuasca, yeah, um, ayahuasca doesn't give a shit. Like ayahuasca is just going to show you that aspect of yourself, yeah, and you'd be yeah. like, oh my god, god dang, and then probably certain you know, sensations of whatever shame might come up or different things. And you're like, Oh my God, I have all this stuff inside of me. And that's why mm -hmm. I was being driven to do this as more of like an outward validation type approach when internally all those aspects, like they're still there. And if you choose to do the thing for whatever reason you do the thing, naturally those aspects will start to arise. Mm -hmm. And so like the reason that I would sit alone in a dark room for, you know, the better part of a week, the start was to see if I could, um, I have like a, an odd masochistic relationship to enjoying doing things like that. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a pretty, it's a, a worthwhile, um, investment. I think, you know, less than a week of your life to do this thing that for the rest of your life, as you know, if you're 80, 90, hundred years old, you will always have that experience. Mm. So to me, it's like, okay, this is a really uncomfortable, hard thing that I'm going to invest myself into doing as a 32 year old or four year old or whatever. And, but now for the rest of my life after that, I have that. Yeah. I know that I did that. I'm certainly going to see aspects of myself that, you know, I wasn't really probably aware of before, mm -hmm. but the reason that, that what like gets me, you know, what gets my like foot into the door with a lot of that stuff really is just like ego. Sure. Sure. And that's very honest of you, man. That's very honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the cool thing is, Maybe you did the darkness retreat because you did the Vipassana and there was some level of comfort there that you had doing the darkness retreat because you did those hard things already. And maybe having done the darkness retreat, it's going to prepare you for the next big challenge that might come up. Yeah. Maybe you don't even know what that is yet, but you would have built yeah, up. Usually like just, I think, I think a person it's wise for a person to just always be training. Yes. Not a hundred percent of your life, but ultimately it's like you could apply that model. That's a big part of like what the my whole shtick is with the align method. And yep. most of the things that I, I stand for, the branding perspective, is that fitness isn't a thing that you do. Mm. It's like you're always fitnessing. It right. doesn't stop. Always preparing. Yeah. And if you're overly O C D about it, it gets weird and you add another tension into the system. But if you can consciously elect to choose behaviors that are more health inducing mm. because you're like, oh my God, okay, we live in this somewhat, you know, at least statistically speaking, pretty toxic world in like Western culture mm. is weird. It's not mm. built for the human organism. It's not not built for it. It's built for creating ease and efficiency, but the human organism actually runs on like en engagement. And so we've outsourced most of our engagement to technology and now the body's getting sick and the body's getting fat and the body's getting anxious and the body's getting depressed and the body's getting right. listless and the body's getting confused. And it's like uh, the body wants to like fight and it wants to, you know, have sex and it wants to play and it wants mm. to wrestle and it wants to be purposeful and it wants to go to the top of the mountain and do the thing that like no one thinks is possible. Yeah. You know, particularly for a guy like that's a very like, like male archetype. Um, that it, it there's like this deep sense of fulfillment that arises from that mm. and we have created we also are really good we're also really intelligent creatures 
And so we've been able to outsource so much of the work that naturally is actually very healing to the body, like walking each day, Yes, you know, moving the body. It's not just nice because you're burning fat or burning calories. You're also circulating lymphatic fluid. You know, you're, you're creating these neuromuscular relationships. You're integrating the hemispheres of the brain. You're, you know, you like every cell in your body is built to get squished and twisted and sheared and turned and pulled. And that's the way it actually circulates. It heals itself. Right. If you outsource that to a robot that actually the robot burns out mm. if you, if you move it too much. You know, so it's the opposite of the human. The human actually gets stronger by being moved. Right. It's a complete. Just opposite. We've yeah, we've we've like given the robots the healing forces that actually are medicinal for the body. We're like, mm -hmm. oh, we outsource that to them, and then the body starts getting a little bit, you know, sick. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting, man. Like, um, mm -hmm. you come from a purse place where you've kind of seen the more stoic side of doing physically hard things, and then it seems like you're trying to tap into more of the emotional side of things. It seems like most how of how men kind of today are you could argue are pretty soft they're kind of the opposite right Bunch of pussies <laughs> right i'm so, a pussy too i mean we all are Big right pussy but in in terms of the physical aspect it's the complete opposite they haven't really trained this is why you're important your job is so important is to provide kind of a pathway for a lot of these guys and girls but yeah. from what your path was in terms of building the rigidity of the physical side and then now tapping into the emotional side Seems like it's the opposite for most people. Mm. How would you define masculinity mm. for you? Masculinity probably <clears throat> would be the, I mean, if you ask me this in four minutes, I'd probably have a different definition, but it'd probably be um, the thing that comes to mind is like being courageous enough to tell the truth. So like being honest within yourself, honest within all aspects of your life. Uh, or as many aspects as you can to the degree that you're capable. Yeah. And what your honesty right now in this moment, it could shift after maybe spending some time doing a hard thing, mm. you know, go climb a big mountain, go do a Vipassana retreat, yeah. go be in a relationship with somebody for a couple of years and like go through like the winter phase of the relationship and see what arises within that. Right. Go do some therapy, mm. you know, have like an honest reflection back and have that accountability, like choose to put yourself into situations where you, ha you have the accountability that you can't bullshit yourself. Yeah. I think that, and then within that, it's like being courageous enough to do the hard thing, say the hard thing, like do what is right. And you mm. know what is right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, and the thing that if you're, if you um, orient yourself around a lot of decisions that weren't you know, for the good of all that weren't, it wasn't the right, like you're inflicting hurt, pain into, into the world, into another person, into yourself, um, with regularity, whether that's your work, you might be making a ton of money, mm -hmm. but you, you know, where that money is coming from, it's coming from maybe like pouring a bunch of sewage into rivers, so you're killing a bunch of animals, right. you know, eventually that sewage inevitably comes back into your family and they're drinking it from their water and they're drinking it from their food. And, you know, like, so I think that that would be an example of a person where it's like superficially, it seems pretty strong, pretty masculine, done the right thing. But at a deeper, if you keep on going deeper into the, into the layers, you're like, oh, actually I'm injecting pain into the world. Yes. Not very masculine. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's a different definition. <laughs> I like the definition. I like the definition. I think it's a lot of what you do is that mind and body connection, right? I'm going to totally paraphrase this, but Seneca has some sort of a a quote that says, we must treat the body rigorously so the mind can tell the body who the fuck is in charge. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't say that exactly, but yeah, right. it's the whole idea of conquering your mind and using your body as this facility to have this control over the difficult things that are going to be coming your way, right? Mm -hmm. And the body is like a direct relationship to that because if you can conquer the body, you can have the self-respect and the confidence to be able to handle other things in your life. I would think the language of conquering comes a little bit like a gray iron age, property owning, mm -hmm. patriarchal type language. Yeah. Love the patriarchy, love like all, all, all things, no, no hate on any of the things. But the feeling of like conquering the mind probably creates a lot of like tension and, and resistance mm -hmm. and actually a gap between coming into authentic relationship Interesting. with the mind. 
you know, so I think that that would be something that I would find interesting. And that's, and that's a very, would be a very common lens because it feels very strong. Feels very feels nice. Very, yeah. It's yeah. It's a, it's a it, yeah. Yeah. That's probably why Seneca said that. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah like, back Seneca, dude. From an empire, baby. <laughs> Okay. But try, how would you treat your son? How would you treat your daughter? How would you treat your partner, male or female? Would you ever try to conquer any of those individuals? Connect. Yeah. 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 Connect, come into relationship, come into like right relationship with, yeah. come into ease, come into integration. Align. Yeah, align. Yeah. Yeah. How has that been for you as you started to align your mind and work on some of the emotional side? work on the relationship side, some of the stuff that we talked about, as you became to improve aligning your body, talk to me about how that relationship has changed and how you see the mind and body connection. There's not a separation. Um, and I have so much, I'm addicted to my cell phone. I'm, I have all sorts of avoidant behaviors. I have, you know, like I, a lot of the things that I, um, aspire to be there's like distance between me and that and a lot of things that i enjoy communicating about to me it's a lot of like aspirational communication mm. you know so i definitely am then absolutely not in any state of like full integration mm -hmm. you know give me an uh, example oh just think you know I'm, I'm like anybody else if i have like the like the phantom limb experience of like my phone's you know, it gets lost or something like that. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's not true. I, I, I was pretty sure I lost my phone. I was at Barton Springs the other day in Austin, like two days ago. Mm. And I was like pretty confident I lost my phone and all my credit cards in there. And I was actually pretty chill about it. Wow. So maybe I'm doing a little better than I think. I think you're giving yourself, <laughs> give yourself one. <laughs> the phone's gone. <laughs> I, didn't it. I, was like, I was like, oh, cool. That's a lot better. Wow. Um, and but, just, yeah. I mean, uh, but I, just like, but just like neurotic, you know, checking of messages and emails and all that stuff. Like a feeling, I think a, a uh, there's another quote from somebody like the, the, the completely butchering and paraphrasing, you'll probably be able to say the quote perfectly, but uh, most of the ales that most of the problems that modern man's experience, that modern man experiences is an inability to be alone with themselves. And mm. Whoever said that, however you said that, it wasn't exactly that. Yeah, no. But that's the you said it great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally and, true. and so and so that is a, I think a massive issue that I experience and a lot of other people experience. And that's why I seek out certain experiences like mm. that, where it's like, oh, they literally like take your phone away in a ziploc bag and they remove it from you because you're an addict, bro. Right. I know you think you got this all sorted out, but yeah. like you would have so much more exponential amplified just growth in mm. relation to yourself and to your wife into your kids and just just to, to like humaning if you maybe had a little bit more spaciousness to just like be bored yeah you know like like there was a time i'm only 30 i turned 37 in, in, in a month uh so as a young person and i didn't have cell phones and whatnot so i like it was just like the cusp yes yeah. of that and in that time frame you use your imagination you know, and you just hang out and like, what do you do if you don't have a phone to distract? Yeah. What do you do if you don't have, if you don't, if you, yeah, exactly. Really, I think uh, there, was, there, was, there was some part around, but not when I was like a little guy, thankfully. Um, Thank but you. what you, what you do is you just can look at rocks. Yeah. There yeah, you pick up rocks. Yeah. And you're like, wow, the shape of this rock. Right. Or how old is this thing? Yeah. Yeah. You know, or you look at bugs, or you look up at clouds. Like, when was the last time you were hanging out with somebody and you looked up the clouds and you did like the game of of, of visualizing, like, what does that cloud look like? Right, right. Oh, like, that's <laughs> that's dope. Yeah, that's a really important thing for the human brain and the human mind and like the the spirit, if you're willing to venture into that language. Mm -hmm. You know, it, as opposed to all of the information being provided to you, it puts you into a place where it's like, I need to actually create my world. Right. I need to create fun. So we've atrophied our capacity to be able to actually endogenously create fun mm. because we're waiting for the fun to be projected onto our eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get, you know, we start getting a little neurotic. Yeah. It's, it's true. And this is, this is my, my point around that is it's interesting when you see reports of seeing ghosts or spirits, yeah. it's almost always in rural areas where there's nothing around, where there's not a lot of sensations. You never hear mm. 40,000 ghost reports in New York City because yeah. people's senses are just deadened at this point and they're not aware of 
the senses and the and the things that are around them. Um, so it's true, like we're just not as aware of our bodies, and that's where the illness comes from. We don't we're not really aware to gut pains that we have. Yeah, illness doesn't arise when you're when you are attending to the body when you're attending like relationship issues don't arise so much if you're actually investing in and in, in, in attending to the relationship so when there's like a little micro issue coming up and you don't say oh that actually felt a little bit like that felt like a ripple that felt like something that that didn't really it was like a wrinkle yeah you said something your tone i said something i kind of i was a little disrespectful to you mm. in that the way that i said that like how did that make you feel yeah like like stop mm. as opposed to being like okay that was like a it was like a three out of ten you know it wasn't that bad right but like i feel a little bit worse about myself because of what aaron said mm. or the way that he said it yep and so that it's like okay we can choose like okay cool it's fine it wasn't that big a deal but it just sits it goes boom okay cool we have information it just now sits in the body of your partner and also of yourself because making someone else feel worse about themselves you're just making yourself feel worse about sure. yourself. Sure. Even if superficially you're kind of raising yourself up temporarily, you know that it, deep down it hurts to hurt people. You know, and so that would be something, it's a similar thing with your body. If you're actually attending to all the aspects of, of the body and of your breathing and your visual muscles and just generally getting movement and really just like putting yourself into natural situations more often. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's really not that complicated. If you try to break down the body into like a, you know, like, like a complicated system, like a, like a car, and you're trying to understand how the carburetor works and how the, you know, all the different nuts and bolts and pulleys and levers and all that stuff work, like you're never going to be able to figure it out. Right. The body is this amazing, beautiful, complex system that is completely integrated. It's one system. You can't pull on any aspect of the body or the mind without it spilling throughout the entirety of the system. Mm. It's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah. 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 And so if you are in a world where your attention is mostly going out, you know, and it's mostly like you're just allowing the world to be projected upon you and you have, you have just these ongoing distractions throughout the day, it's very easy for stuff to start to back up. Mm. And that stuff could be some type of inflammation or it could be some type of maybe some type of growth that's starting to form someplace or it could be some type of joint misalignment that you know you would notice if you're more sensitive in your body because you just do things that make you more sensitive yeah and you're like oh, i want to clean that up uh, but since we're largely numbing ourselves which is super fun the ways that we numb ourselves is like super fun There's so many options it's a it. good time mm -hmm. yeah it's like a carnival yeah it's not all bad yeah like it's, it's a, like, I'm very grateful for all of the carnival numbing avoidant behaviors and distractions that we have access to because yeah. it's, it's a really good time. Uh, but if that's what you steep your world into primarily, like almost absolutely, you're going to be missing some really vital information for your own health and well being and, you know, growth and integration and all that stuff within yourself. How do we become more sensitive? You mentioned if we're not sensitive to be aware of some of these things that are creeping up whether it's pain or sensitivity or emotions, how have you at least or advised people to become more sensitive to those things? Mm. Take your shoes off. Yeah. Just do anything that, that induces sensitivity. Yeah. yeah. Um, expose more of your skin to sunlight. You know, look at sun as actually a physical objective. Um, like think of it as like nutrition. Yeah. Fuel. You know, so when you, when you, if I'm drinking, I'm drinking a can of this freaking whatever iced tea thing you know or i'm eating a hoagie it's like an objective thing going into my face yeah that's sun that's photonic energy in the waves and the particles it's like it's hitting your skin and you're processing it and the vitamin d and you know the mitochondria is like a little, all of your cells are saying oh yeah mm -hmm. like your cells are like dancing to that relationship yeah, yeah. that's sensitivity um you know take your shoes off like it's like your 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 feet have something like I think it's like 6,000 uh, sensory nerve receptors in each foot. Don't quote me on that. I think it's 6,000. But an, an immense amount of sensory information is being poured into your feet all the time. Mm. Right? You have, I believe, 27 bones in each foot. I think it's 33 joints in each foot. Wow. It's built for complex movement. Yeah. When you put your feet into these like coffins that desensitize this unbelievably sensitive instrument called a human foot mm. it sends all of the information this all of this proprioceptive feedback through that your entire body and your brain 
as saying, this is where I'm at in space. I'm sensed, I'm sensitive to where I'm at in space right now forever and ever until the advent of like, like perfectly plain cement roads and sidewalks, we had contour. Yeah. It's just a part of being a human is yeah. having contour, you know? And so if you remove that contour and everything just becomes flat, it's like for a long time in history, humans would exercise in the form of like dance and wrestling and they'd throw spears and they'd yes. sprint Champion. and chase whatever, whatever yeah. you know, just like God, they crawl on the ground and they play with their kids. And then suddenly culture shifted and the only physical movement that any person in the modern world does is a bicep curl and a tricep extension. <laughs> so like you have this insane capacity to do so much yeah. and you've whittled it down to this is, this is what it is. Mm. It's, it look good. It's kind of <laughs> like what you're doing with your feet. Yeah. There's all this immense capacity for, for range and exploration and like this proprioceptive lightning storm, mm -hmm. every step that you take. And now it's just kind of, okay, a little limited dorsiflexion and some plantar flexion, limited dorsiflexion, some plantar flexion. Everything else is kind of desensitized. Yeah. Yeah. So and like those would be two things. Just take your shoes off and walk outside in the sun, you know, get like grab a tree branch, mm. you know, hang off of it. Yeah. Put your phone down for a moment. You know, it's gonna be really helpful with actually, um, healing the the bioelectric aspect of your body which is like all aspects of your body this yeah. bioelectric organism it's helpful with reducing inflammation it's helpful with creating more of a sense of ease and just like huh. while you're doing that have an exhalation while you're doing that relax your eyeballs your eyes are continuous with your central nervous system with your brain and so you're continually tuning your autonomic nervous system with the way that you use your eyes. If I'm myopically focusing on my phone all day or on anything all day, mm. I'm putting myself into a more of an excited, sympathetic, ready to go state. And if I space out, I just like, you know, I'm just taking in the whole room, just chilling. My nerve, naturally my breath is gonna start to lean more towards a, an exhalatory pattern. Mm. <sighs> and what is that? Just looking around and- Just look around. Looking look up. close, far. Yeah, if you're, if you're if you're tired, if you're anxious, look up. Yeah, like look up at trees, look up at clouds. It's helpful with with actually boosting energy. It's helpful with boosting creativity. Hmm. What is that? Why is it about looking up that makes us less tired or have more energy? It's been wired because your eyes are your brain, and it's been wired for ever, depending upon your belief system, evolution. That if I'm looking up and around, what am I probably doing compared to if I'm looking down mm. like this if i'm looking up and around i'm probably becoming a i'm probably doing that because i'm doing some activity that necessitates alertness right thinking looking for prey whatever yeah there's something there's something oh, shit, what's it? yeah the trees. you know yeah you know or i'm daydreaming and i'm like wow that's amazing. you know compared to if i'm like down here looking down at the floor maybe i'm depressed Maybe I'm pensive. Maybe I'm just like deeply introspective. Maybe I'm a little melancholy. Mm. You know, it's 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 all these 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 wired patterns based off of millennia of, of behavior. And so now we can start to kind of come in and through the body, like mechanically move the body in such a way that informs our state. Mm. So the way that you breathe, like your your breath is actually it's one of the only systems in the body that where it's actually tied into the autonomic and the somatic aspect of yourself. So autonomic being like, I don't have any control of it. Somatic being like muscles, like soma in yeah. the body. And so the um, portion of the brain that's actually controlling your breath, it's at the very bottom of the brainstem. It's literally the bridge between the brain and the body. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It, the, like the placement of that. And so it's, 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 it, it, figuratively and literally is the bridge between the brain and the body. And so if you're feeling some type of way, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling too sleepy, any of that, and you're like, man, I want to change my state. My options aren't just limited to taking a melatonin supplement or to smoking some pot or to drinking some coffee because my breathing pattern in that state will, will exactly match the state itself. Mm. So I also have the option to move the levers of my physiology to start to change the way that I feel. Yeah, I love that message because 
pretty much like all of the things that you're saying is instead of looking for external things like pots or things that are going to energize us that we can consume, we have all of these systems within our bodies. We just have to make specific tweaks, like the way we breathe or the way we move. It's all there. It's just figuring out the right method, the line method to be able to do that and mm. to trigger our bodies and, and, the, and the way we feel in a different way. It's all, it's all there and disposable. No, we don't, and we don't have to, we like, we, let's, let's, we get to, it's like a really cool thing. Yeah. It's just, we grow up in a school system that the teachers don't know about how to operate the body. Like the teachers are just another statistic, mm. you know, for the most part, if you're a grade school teacher or high school teacher or whatever, pretty low probability that you're like really super duper into this stuff. Mm. You know, it's, it's kind of more of like an esoteric world, like really paying attention to physiological systems and yeah. self-regulation and such. And it's a bit like the subjects that children are being taught it's it's not this stuff it's you know you're learning like arithmetic and you're learning history you're learning like this is when this war was fought and this colonel and this general and then he killed him and then they signed the you know whatever and then he conquered this and then they conquered <laughs> that and i'm like what is that history like who cares yeah. when what was conquered right like right. there's even a richer history beyond beyond that i think which is like what were the people like mm. you know like how do they live you know, what were they curious about? What were they afraid of? What were their hopes and dreams and desires? Like, what was the, like, like, there's so much to history, which is, I think there's, there's uh, my buddy, Daniele Bolelli. He does, I think his podcast is called History on Fire. Um, he's good at that when, in sharing history through the lens of like the people, mm. you know, which I think that's another thing. Like when you think of history, it's just this rote memorization of when cannons were fired where yeah. and when you know, whatever, whoever was the, like the winner of the war then writes the history. Right. And they you know, kind of share it's true. It's just a bunch of mm. dates. Yeah. Like it's not that valuable in comparison to, um, I think learning about like how to human mm. and like learning about like, how did humans human 200 years ago, a thousand years ago? Yeah. How do I human now? How do I human better? Talk to me about that. So what are the things that our ancestors back in the day before we had all of these modern technology? What are some of the things that we're doing today that are probably just the complete opposite of what they were doing? And how can we align ourselves more closely to move the way they do, to, to live the way they do, and really the way the human should be? Because that's just the way we've been designed, but we're kind of limiting ourselves by sitting and doing all these things that modern technology and comfort yeah. has been keeping us down. I mean, there's a lot of things. And one, it's not like something that can happen that I'm guilty of for sure is like romanticizing like anything that's the past, you know, and, and poo pooing on like anything that's now, like whatever's happening now, this sucks. Everything that passed was awesome. Mm. It was like, there's a lot of really cool stuff right now. Yeah. You know, and, and, and but physiologically speaking, if you look at um, like the skulls of Native Americans, for example, or various different tribes from around the world, um, their facial structure is very different than modern people and their teeth. They don't have as much issues with crooked teeth. I heard of malisclusions. They don't have like the narrow, like I grew up with, like the narrow um, upper palate or I actually had to have one of those expanders where you like put it in between the upper palate and you like mm. click it back each day because my upper palate is like collapsing on itself, you know, at growing up and I yeah. was almost certainly breathing from my mouth for that mm. to have happened. I'm eating really soft food so people of of past were eating harder foods they're eating meat they're eating you know root vegetables and things like they're actually having to use you know and they're also uh breastfeeding mm. you know that's like one of the first moments for a, a a child to start to to um be creating healthy architecture for their facial bones is actually latching onto their mother's breast and they're doing that, that like that sucking and they're reaching the jaw forward. And like, that's, it's not just getting nutrition. The way that they get nutrition via evolution is actually structuring the body simultaneously. And so if you take those things away, you outsource that to uh, some type of like baby feed bottle scenario, and they don't actually have to go through those motions. You're from the drop, from the, like the, the, the very initial 
access to the world, you're already setting that child up for malocclusion of the teeth, maybe closing of the nasal passages, and their mouth and their jaw just gets a little bit narrower. And their face goes a little bit more adenoid. Mm. It's like, it's like a, a little bit like long and thin. So now you're from the drop, you're putting yourself into a, a respiratory position that is a little bit more anxious. And it's, and it's a little bit uh, less robust in its ability to be able to actually like breathe and fill up the lungs. And then you place that child into um, a chair all day. You know, they go to kindergarten or first grade or whatever, and they like learn how to be an adult. Yeah. If you want to see what people of old were like, I would say probably just like hang out with a kid before they go to kindergarten. Mm. You know, and and for the most part, a kid before they go to kindergarten, they're going to be laying on the ground. They're going to lay on their side. They're going to lay on their belly. They're going to lay on their back. They're going to sit in a straddle position. They're going to sit in a cross-legged position. They're going to sit on some weird rock. You know, they're going to play. They're going to create stuff. Yeah. yeah. They're going to use, they're going to be forced to use their imagination, you know, and that, that, just that act of being in that environmental situation where the body is forced to kind of explore as opposed to atrophy in those different ways, that's the most healing thing a human being could possibly do for themselves. Mm. And then they're outside like all the time. Yeah. Just be outside a lot. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things. It's like the, the modern domesticated creature is just, it's inside too much. Mm. You know, and so if you are outside, you're getting more sunlight. So it's going to be supportive for cellular function globally through your whole body, you know, vitamin D levels, hormonal levels, all the things, um, you know, the grounding part that we kind of like very briefly touched on. Yeah. Uh, but structurally speaking, if you're sitting on a chair all day long, the body will, will start to become toxic. The reason the body becomes toxic is because the main way that you circulate, um, lymphatic fluid, it's kind of like the, like the garbage system the sewer system throughout your body your lymphatic glands are placed in parts throughout the body that have a lot of movement so they're in the back of the knees the popliteal space they're in the inguinal area and around the the the, the groin the hips they're in the stomach they're in the uh, up around the neck the clavicle and the armpit all these places the way that that fluid circulates is through muscular contraction it's always contracting by sitting so if it's, it's not always control, well, it's, it's, it's stuck in like a crimped position. So imagine if your toilet system had a crimp, not just one crimp, had a bunch of crimps throughout it. And you tried to flush one of your poops, mm. like it might kind of sort of go down, but like some stuff backs up and then yeah. you poop on there again. And you're like, oh my gosh, blocked up. It's blocked up. Mm. I gotta call a plumber. Like your plumbing system in your body is just movement. It's super not complicated. You know, and your calves, they act as pump systems to bring the lymph and, you know, all of the fluid from your lower body up into the upper body. Mm -hmm. Every time your calves go through a little contraction or lengthening and contraction, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, it's going, it's pumping all that fluid from low up to high. Yeah. If you turn that off, your body just starts to go into stasis. It just stagnates and, you know, those fluids that would be clear and beautiful and, you know, health inducing, they start to get um, stagnant mm. and you start to get sick. I want to go deeper into each of these. Um, so breathing for one, I know we, we kind of touched on breathing and then we went back. Why is it important to breathe through our nose? And what is like the proper way to breathe? Even Like how, most people, they breathe through the nose, but most people are doing it through their chest. Like what is the proper way? to breathe, to maximize? There's not a proper way. It just depends on the situation and what you're doing. Uh, I have a buddy called Brian McKenzie who he created something called the gear system of mm -hmm. breathing, which makes a lot of sense. And it's like first through fifth gear, first gear is long, slow, inhalation, exhalation through the nose. And then you can start to go into second gear, which I think is like faster inhalation, exhalation. And then it can be third gear, which I think is, is inhalation through the nose, exhalation to the mouth. Eventually you get to fifth gear and it's, inhale, exhale through the mouth. And you're trying to continually downregulate yourself or bring yourself down gears. Huh. So ideally you get yourself into a situation where you're working pretty darn hard and you're still able to maintain inhalation through the nose, exhalation through the nose. And what that's going to do, this isn't the structural part yet. The structural part helps this happen. But what's going to do is going to send a signal to your physiology. Uh, the term for this is called the, the bore effect. When your body has uh, access to less oxygen, less air, you're breathing less, suddenly you start to raise your CO2 levels. You also raise acidity of the blood, and that sends a signal to the hemoglobin cells 
in the, the red blood cells, the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, to be more liberal with releasing oxygen. And so when you get the signal that there's not as much oxygen floating around here, your blood says, cool, we'll get smarter. When you get the signal that we've got an oxygen buffet because mm. I'm over breathing all the freaking time. The healthiest breath pattern for a person generally be around like five, six breaths per minute. Right? Really? That, lo that low? Yeah. If you're like real calm and your body is not starving for oxygen at all, I mean, it's also interesting as well. I got this from, I think I might have learned this from uh, James Nestor's uh, book, Breathe. Uh, if you look at a lot of different, uh, very consistently, like different mantras uh, throughout, you know, different religions and such, when you're doing these, like these singing, these mantras or speaking these mantras, it will actually place your breather breathing pattern into around that like five breaths per minute range, mm. just based off of like how you communicate the mantras, Interesting, which is pretty cool. So a lot of this, this spiritual stuff that we, you know, still do and have done throughout history also is just health inducing practices it's like human hygiene practices couched in spirituality mm. which is pretty cool yeah because if you just tell someone to breathe every five six six times every minute it's kind of hard to keep track but if you're just seeing the hums of the mantra yeah it's kind of like a hack yeah so while you're sweeping up your kitchen or whatever just be just be singing your mantra yeah and what you'll find is you're actually tuning your physiology to to be super healthy and and parasympathetic and calm and chill Fascinating. and if you're super parasympathetic and calm and chill that means your body says cool menstruation awesome digestion awesome tissue repair awesome got it mm. if if you are sending a signal to your physiology that you are actually under threat and that threat could have transpired from something that happened between you and your uncle when you were seven years old or something, some neglect that you had from your mom or dad or some car accident that happened. And ever since that happened, you didn't quite feel safe. Mm. And your physiology has kind of been breathing in such a way that like, I don't really trust the world. I know some bad crap is going to happen at any time. I don't have time to be, to be relaxed. I don't have time to digest. I don't have time to repair. I don't have time to sleep. Sh shit is hitting the fan. Mm. And so you will run that pattern and you'll start to create the world around you to match that. You'll start having a, a bias towards all the terrible crap that can happen. Right. And imagine that terrible crap just keeps on happening. And your physiology is, is running in that way. And so now when people are around you, there's a little bit of a sensation of like tension. Mm. So you start to reflect, the world reflects back to you what you project out. Yeah, that's so true. Because we're always attuning to each other. So throughout this conversation, naturally, if one of our breathing patterns was like wildly different than the other, we would naturally start to find a little bit more of like a homeostasis or a balance between that. Mm. And it would probably match whoever's like the alpha in the situation. Mm. So if there's like five of us here and there's one person that clearly is like, they're the chief. Yeah. We're all, we'll all kind of breathe like the chief. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just to be able to fit in. Just to fit in because you want to feel safe. Yes. That's the most important thing. Mm. All your nervous system cares about, am I safe? Am I not safe? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's tricky because our body doesn't know the difference between what our ancestors used to feel in terms of fear and paranoid where a tribe would attack us and it was either life or death. Yeah. But for us to have these imaginary fears of us running out of money or not being able to pay the bills or our family members passing away. Yeah. Well, they're very real fears. They're real fears, but sometimes they're just chronic and ongoing. Right. That's the issue. Right. It's and a very real fear to not be able to pay rent, have a fear of like, I might not be able to sustain myself. Mm. I might not be accepted by the tribe. I might not be accepted by, if I'm a guy, by, by women, yep. you know, because I, I wear a lot of my value in what I can provide. And so the fear is I won't be accepted the fear. And if I'm not accepted, then I'm not safe. And if I'm not safe, then I might just wither up and die cold and alone. Yeah. It's terrifying. Just it's very, 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 like, very real. Yeah, it is real. It yeah. is real. But it's chronic and our body doesn't know this. It's a chronicness that's the issue. Yeah. 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 Another thing that I've recently gone into is hanging because I've had some shoulder issues. Mm. And it was the first time I actually researched more about the benefits of hanging beyond shoulders. Mm. What is it about hanging that is so beneficial? And, and, how does it align to what our ancestors used to do? Hmm. Our shoulders are structured to hang, whether it's important or not. It has good effect. Uh, we're, we are better brachiators, a 50 cent word for hanging, than monkeys. 
you know, so cute, like something that's kind of cute, like monkey bars, like a misnomer. It'd be, mm -hmm. I'd be called like human bars or ape bars. Right. You know, so the shape of our hands and our thumbs, the fact that I can reach my hand up across my head and, and grab, you know, either my ears like this. That's something that a monkey would have a lot of trouble with. Oh, really? Yeah. And so reaching over across like this, like to get the arm straight up overhead like this is actually not a very common thing. And it's because of their shoulders. It just doesn't. It's the structure of the shoulder girdle, the length of the clavicle. Yeah, the range of motion that we're able to get. Ah, interesting. And so when you're in this upright hanging position like that, <clears throat> for whatever reason, maybe it's because we grew up in the African savanna as brachiating ape creatures, mm -hmm. and then we got moved down to the grasslands and became bipedal. Uh, maybe it's because God or Krishna or Jehovah or whatever thought it would be cool for us to play and you know, on monkey bars, like what, whoever, whatever your belief system of how humans got to this point right now, yeah. the shoulder girdle is 100% structured to hang, mm. structured to go up overhead. And when you do that, uh, it opens up some of the lymphatic space in here. That's a healthy thing, right? So this is one of the primary, this is the lowest pressure system in the body for lymphatic fluid. If this is backed up in around the clavicle and the neck and the shoulders and the armpit, then the rest of the body doesn't have any space to be able to circulate that lymphatic fluid. So you're going to get backed up. Uh, hanging is going to be opening up some of the connective tissue in and around the ribs, allowing you to breathe. So it's opening up some of that intercostal tissue, yeah, which is great. Um, if there's any tension in and around those muscles in the neck, outside of the lymphatic stuff, it's just going to it's going to create autonomic tension throughout the rest of the body. Like your nervous system kind of runs a little tight. Um, if you have shoulder impingement syndrome, you're getting pain or like any limitation of range of motion, which is a lot of people in in modern world because we're chronically sitting in a pretty hunched over, immediately rotated, protracted, protractor being like push forward position. Also a lot of like forward head posture. So we get gummed up in the shoulder joint mm -hmm. and then the the bones and the tendons and the ligaments that need to be able to, and the muscles that need to be able to slide in order to get that shoulder up into full overhead flexion, they end up starting to get kind of like hard and dehydrated. And if you could just allow yourself to decompress and just hang off of a bar, his book called Shoulder Pain by a guy called Dr. John Kirsch. He's an orthopedic surgeon. I reference, I have a whole chapter in the Line Method book um, called Hanging, I think. Hanging, something, something, some, probably something about like probably our, our ancestral primal ape thing. Yes. Um, and in that, there's the, I, I kind of create my own iteration of it, but he has a protocol that he found had healed or cured 99% of his patients that would come in for surgery for some type of shoulder impingement syndrome. 99%. That's what he says in the book. Wow. You can get the book. Um, and so the shoulder hanging or the hanging protocol is just, it's pretty simple. There's a few exercises and then the bulk of it would be, uh, well, the exercise, I guess, could be the bulk as well. They're important also. But the hanging aspect of it is just a 90 second total of hanging each day. So that could be 15 seconds, six times, mm. be one bout of 90 seconds, however you want to do it. And just get a pull up bar, put it in a common place that you walk through regularly. Don't put it in a gym or something like that. Yeah. Put it in like a bathroom. Make it easy. Make it easy. Yeah. You know, you become the shape of your environment. You know, so if you put a pull up bar in your doorway, suddenly like you become a hanger. Mm. Just like that. Like you spent thirty dollars on Amazon or wherever, put a pull up bar there. And now suddenly you have just evoked probably hundreds of hours of shoulder mobility and lung mobility and rib mobility and circulation of lymphatic fluid and, and decompression and lengthening of your spine just because you put this stupid hanging apparatus in your doorway. Yeah. It's so stupid. Yeah. But it's so easy if you think about it. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big, it's, that's, that's a big hack. It's yeah. a big hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything that, everything that's like, really really amazing mm -hmm. is almost stupid to talk about yeah like getting like spending some time getting up and down off of the ground like that's the number one leading reason that elderly need, need assisted living as they've they've it's fall risk they yeah. just can't get off the ground mm -hmm. that's a terrible situation to be in as a human being if once i'm up if i if i go down i'm not getting up unless i call somebody yeah that's that that's would scary. be really scary yeah i think peter et also says he has a couple measures of how long like how, how your health state is. And one of the things that he uses is the dead hang, mm -hmm. right? Of how long yeah. like men should be able to do it for 90 seconds or something. Women should be able to do it for 60 seconds. And it's like, that's like the measure, right? Yeah. That's how important it is. Like, it's also like something about how tight your, your grip strength is has to 
can also increase your growth hormones or something like that. Mm, that makes that, sense. Yeah. Well, anytime you're strengthening anything throughout your body, you're going to be increasing growth hormones. Yeah. So grip strength, yes. But other stuff, yes, too. I don't yeah. know that. So if there's like specific research or data around. I'm not sure. I'm sure, I'm sure there are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, every time you're squeezing your your grip, you're going to be it's you're going to be creating a challenge for the body and the and the body will respond with that with growth factors yeah but grip that's strength something that's something's interesting it's a higher predictor of longevity than blood pressure which wow. that's kind of an interesting thing. why is that it's probably because blood pressure grip strength would be indicative of a person that's really um engaged in their stuff. life they're yeah. doing stuff yeah they're raking leaves they're climbing ladders they're, they're yeah. like they're doing things mm. um and so that that would be, I, I I would presume the reason that a marker like that would be more predictive of overall health. Yeah. Also, leg strength is another really strong predictor of overall health and longevity. And then uh, lung capacity is the biggest. Right. That's like the, it's called the Framingham Framingham study. I think it was done fifty two hundred people, and they found that the uh, most powerful predictor of longevity in that was uh, lung capacity, lung health. Like VO two max. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're, yeah, if you if you are limited in because your lungs, your lungs aren't just your lungs. It's not you're not just getting air. Having a supple, elastic diaphragm is going to be ongoing organ massage throughout the whole day. It's going to be ongoing lymphatic drainage throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. It's going to be ongoing. I already said organ massage, but the, the motility of the organs, they have, they go through a subtle rotational pattern yep. all day long. They rotate in, they rotate out. they're like breathing. Mm. And this is all like, our body is so darn active. Like we seem like we're pretty still and pretty chill. Everything is moving all the time. And so if you have, if your main primary biggest pump in the whole entire body is limited or stifled for some reason, then everything is a bit more limited throughout the entirety of the system. And so, yeah, if you care about performance uh, and longevity, uh, lung health, diaphragm health, respiratory health is a major one. Mm. Dude, so this has been incredibly insightful, right? Uh, there's so much information, little hacks that, there's a lot of information basically, but I think the biggest thing that people struggle with is kind of the, the way we started the conversation is this idea or this Ability to embrace the uncomfort mm -hmm. and to go through the struggle, to go through the resilience. Yeah. What's something, because you've definitely gone through a lot of the difficult things that maybe people aren't willing to do, right? Physically and emotionally, just to sit with yourself in the darkness and also. For, um, so what are, what are some of the ways that you can advise people to embrace doing uncomfortable things and to actually take action on all the information that you've given because it's great to have information but if they're not taking the small little steps it doesn't yeah. really matter right i think if i were to have some suggestion with that something i was working with a, a client the other day and something that i was observing which is very common among like me and all sorts of people is they were really excited to and this is going to sound cliche so i apologize in advance but they're really excited to um get to the like peak expression of the rep of like the exercise that we were doing and they were kind of losing attention we were doing like a single leg good morning so and then mm -hmm. they were holding a little kettlebell and dropping down hinging themselves forward like one of those like bird feeder yep things um and they were really excited to get up into the standing position and like find balance like cool like i'm stacked i'm standing up this is amazing like i made it through the rep and they would kind of and in doing that because they were focused on arising or arriving at that that end peak expression of the thing they would kind of forget where they're at because they're trying to rush through the whole repetition and the cue that worked really well for her and you know it's a cue that i've probably used lots of times before that but is start to see every aspect of the rep as being the location like every place that you're at like this is perfect this is exactly where you're at and like really make this like midway through the rep it doesn't look interesting on instagram like there's nothing really great about that position but every aspect of it is like, cool, like I'm at the finish line. Mm -hmm. And now I move two centimeters, like, oh, this is amazing. Like really sink into the quality of that. Sink into the quality of like, oh, how's my breath right now? Sink into the quality of like, what's the, how's the, the positioning of my pelvis? There's a, a quote from, I think it was, 
uh, the fella that created, I was gonna say Miyamoto Masashi, but it's not him. The fella that created judo, hmm. um, I'm pretty sure it was judo. And the, I wish I knew what his name was right now. I reference it in my book, actually. I have a quote, so it's actually, I'm quoting, quoting it from that. Um, but he's with his students and they're going through this, the same motion of the same repetition, like, like hundreds of times over and over and over again. And one of the students is like, whatever your name is, founder of judo. Like, how can we do this? Like, this is like, can we please do something else? Like, this yeah, is getting yeah. so annoying doing the same freaking rep every single time. And the the sensei says to the teachers, like, you idiot. Like, once you realize that every rep is a brand new rep, then you'll finally be practicing judo. Mm -hmm. And it's like it, getting into that energy is a similar thing with like the Vipassana thing. You know, it's like, it's like, wow, this sensation of anxiety, this sensation of sadness, this sensation of feeling just like annoyed or feeling irritated or ah, like nothing's working out. That's it. Mm -hmm. So can you, instead of trying to push that away, can you actually embrace that and still have a path of where you're trying to go? Don't just like flail and be like, cool, this is it. I'm playing. Like, this is amazing. Like don't yeah. take action, but being able to be with the uncomfort and, and actually augment your perception of the discomfort of as instead of it being something to get away from mm -hmm. make it be something to become really curious about and something that i find incredibly helpful is identifying will this kill me and will this and this is is this actually an injury so I'm, if i'm like you know i've been I used to be in like rock climbing and whatnot uh and that would be a thing of like someone would kind of get like a little hurt somehow and we we're like out you know yeah. wherever that would be a question is like is this an injury like, is this like an actual injury or is this just like an owie and different being able to differentiate? Like, am I actually injuring myself right now? And if I'm injuring myself back up. Yeah. But if this is just, if this is just discomfort, then there's actually this amazing opportunity to become really curious about it. Mm. And so can you start to change or augment your lens of discomfort? As long as it's not actually an injury, you're actually going to die. Just explore seeing like, okay, like how can I become more curious about this and acknowledge that this sensation actually is the location. Like I'm, I'm here, I've arrived. And can I sink into that deeper? Yeah. And yeah. that's like, you know, you do that with like sitting in cold plunge or something like that is a really obvious way to start to um, practice regulating nervous system under duress. Awesome, man. Awesome. Dude, I, uh, I really appreciate you. And I know we just met, but I think your authenticity really comes out in your message. Oh, Obviously cool. the work that you're doing as well. Thanks. I want to make sure people learn about your stuff. We've got the book, The Line Method. I don't there it is. Your face too much, but yeah. uh, where else can people learn about you? Um, so I host a podcast called The Line Podcast. Uh, I've done that for a while. Uh, if people have interest in uh, actually working with their own bodies and training and learning some some techniques and such around that, uh, they're the first week of the Align Method program is free. So people can check that out. If it's of interest, there's a movement assessment in that, which is a cool thing. So people can assess like where, what is the range of their ankles and their knees and their hips and mm -hmm. spine and all that stuff and shoulders, uh, neck and all the different parts and be like, okay, like where am I at? I think that's a really important thing to establish a baseline. Yeah. And then from there, I recommend people to take pictures of themselves, take videos of themselves and be able to then, you know, move through whatever your own program your own training continue with the line method if that's of interest uh but really have that before or after so you can have a reference point of actually seeing where you're at mm, that's cool um that's alignpodcast.com slash amp if you want to do the, the free trial um i think that's it i really enjoyed getting to connect yeah man yeah, yeah let's catch up on cool appreciate you all right thanks for thinking guys appreciate you bye